Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So after five months journeying through John's Gospel, one text at a time, we've reached the end. John began from the very beginning, reminding us that Jesus was the Word of God, who was with God when the heavens and the earth were created. He took us through to the start of Jesus' ministry as he called his disciples, saying, Come and see. John introduced us to the seven signs that pointed to Jesus and who Jesus was, from the wedding at Cana to the feeding of the 5,000 and so many more. He showed us the healings and the wisdom of Jesus and all of the ways <clears throat> and all of the ways that he reached out to all of those in need and also caused the powerful to bristle. John walked us through Jesus' last days from washing the disciples' feet to Jesus' arrest, to Peter denying Jesus three times, to Jesus' crucifixion, last words, death, and burial. John left us feeling as dark and devastated as the disciples felt. But then he brought us the incredible joy of Easter morning when Jesus rose from the dead, destroying the power of death. And John kept writing to tell us about how Jesus repeatedly appeared to the disciples after he was raised, even meeting them on the beach after a random fishing trip. But John didn't stop with that story, so what is there left to say? About eight years ago, when our dog was about 10 months old, we went to Hawaii for almost two weeks. A relative of ours offered to house sit and dog sit while we were gone, which was great. She wanted a place to stay and to play with Ginger, and we obviously needed a puppy sitter. Since she was arriving the day that we were leaving, we didn't have much time to do puppy orientation. So I had typed up the instructions about when and how much to feed her, where her leash and her toys were kept, how to put her in the crate at night, and all the little routine things that would be we had a wonderful time in Hawaii and came home to a very happy, very spoiled puppy. You see, I had forgotten to mention that Ginger wasn't allowed in any of our bedrooms. I know, we're mean dog parents. <laughs> and the dog sitters seemed to think that making Ginger sleep in her crate was mean, even though it was the place that she liked and was used to. So for those two weeks, Ginger slept in our bedroom. But that's not all she did in our bedroom. <laughs> she found our laundry drying rack under the bed and chewed it to smithereens. She found a pair of my tennis shoes and tore one apart, just one. Seeing that mess when we got back made me wish I could have looked into the future to see the potential problems and to include it in my instructions from the very beginning. Maybe you can relate. When you write something important, it would be nice to be able to know the issues that will arise in the future so you can address them. And that's exactly what John was doing. Where Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written between the years 65 and 85, John wasn't written until the year 95 or even 100. So he'd seen things that the other writers hadn't seen. He knew the struggles that arose and where there were issues in the Christian community. So several of the things that John wrote in his gospel were dealing with things that happened long after Jesus rose from the dead in the first decades of the early Christian church. The first part of this lesson is a continuation of the lesson that we heard last week with Peter and the other disciples going fishing, almost like going back to their previous lives rather than living in the joy of Jesus' resurrection. The risen Jesus appeared on the beach, helped them to catch some fish, and they shared breakfast with him around a charcoal fire on the beach. The only other time we hear about a charcoal fire in John is when Peter is standing beside that fire, warming himself while being asked questions like, you're not one of Jesus' followers, are you? And three times Peter said, I'm not. Three times, Peter denied being a disciple of Jesus, despite the fact that he had promised that he would lay down his life for Jesus. 
That night was a nightmare that Peter kept replaying in his head. He wasn't sure he'd ever forgive himself for being so disloyal to his Lord. But here, Jesus pulls Peter aside and asks, Simon, do you love me? Simon Peter says, of course I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. But then Jesus asks him two more times to the point where Peter felt hurt that Jesus had to ask him three times. But wait, maybe that was on purpose. For each of Peter's denials of being a follower of Jesus weeks before, Jesus gave him a new opportunity to declare his love for him. Not only that, but three times Jesus gave Peter a mission. Feed my lambs, tend my flock, feed my sheep. In other words, Jesus wasn't holding on to Peter's denial. He forgave Peter. He was giving him a new responsibility to lead the mission to spread the gospel and to care for the newborn Christian church. And Jesus continues by essentially telling Peter that this new calling isn't going to be an easy one. Where he had been carefree as a younger man, this calling would be more intense, more important, more crucial to the world. And it would lead him to difficult places, ultimately leading Peter to his own cross, where his arms would be stretched out, much like Jesus' arms were stretched out as he was crucified. So anybody reading this gospel would not only see Peter as the one who abandoned Jesus in his time of need, Peter was also the one Jesus called, the leader of the Christian movement who eventually died for what he believed. The next bit is a bit odd. Peter asking what would happen to the beloved disciple, to the, the nameless person who had agreed to care for Jesus' mother at the crucifixion. Jesus talks about the beloved disciple perhaps living until Jesus returns. What's that all about? Well, there was this belief that Jesus would return to the world before the end of most of their lifetimes. So there was this rumor that the beloved disciple, perhaps the author of John himself, wouldn't die. But this passage recognizes that rumor and clarifies that Jesus never said that he wasn't going to die. It seems a strange thing to quibble about, but as the years passed and Jesus didn't return as they expected, there are questions about if Jesus promised something that didn't happen, and so on. So as John is dealing with all of these little questions, wrapping up his gospel more neatly than if he had written 15 years earlier, he re reassures us that he witnessed these things and many other things that Jesus had done, confirming that they're all true. John wrote his gospel so his audience might come to believe that Jesus is Lord and that through faith we would all have the eternal life that Jesus promised. The Gospel of Mark was written 30 or more years before John was written, and it was written a bit more like a newspaper, brief, to the point, just the facts, ma'am. So if Mark was written like a newspaper, John was written more like a novel with similar stories and details, but worked on for decades, deliberated over, edited and re-edited, crafted so every detail had meaning. So every passage revealed something new about Jesus, so that those who read it would come to see themselves in it. And indeed, that's what John helps us to experience. In our lives of faith, we go through times of intense confusion and uncertainty, like Nicodemus did. But we also experience inspiration and true faith, like the Samaritan woman. We vacillate between being the healed blind man and the Pharisees saying, surely we are not blind, are we? We endure the depths of sorrow in losing loved ones like Lazarus. But we're also filled with joy knowing the new life that Jesus is able to bring. We have times like Peter, declaring our commitment to Jesus, then missing our chance to live out that faith. But the thing is, Jesus always gives us another chance, where we, like Peter, often struggle, where we wander a bit, depending on the guidance of our Good Shepherd. We are also the ones Jesus puts his trust in, commissioning us also 
to feed his sheep. Where John was written to help us believe, John also helps us to live out our faith. We'll have moments of clarity like the beloved disciple who seemingly can do no wrong. We'll have moments of doubt and denial and sin like Thomas and Peter and so many more. And what never changes is that God walks with us through all of these seasons of our faith life. God sent his Holy Spirit to guide us, to inspire us, to correct us, and give us endless chances to live as he calls us, helping us to look at the gospel of our lives, to write our story, to make tweaks and edits, to realize that our lives can be a masterpiece guided by the great author of life. Your story is woven together with God's story of salvation and is beautiful and unique. God sent Jesus to be a main character in your story, promising you endless love and grace, forgiveness, encouragement, joy, and the most miraculous ending imaginable. And with his help, you get to write all the rest in between. Our hymn of the day is number 696, Jesus Calls Us 